pretty much. Um, we did this trip just about a year ago, sadly. <laughs> we wish we were going back this year. Um, and uh, just to let you know what the format of our travel was, we, we generally, my husband and I, usually travel independently. We make our own arrangements and we do our own thing. But um, a friend tipped us off uh, to a hot deal on the Windstar Cruise Line, which is a small ship cruise line. Um, and uh, we said, what the heck, let's check it out. So we opened the website, and they were offering 80% off their fares. Oh, 80% off. So we couldn't grab the phone fast enough. <laughs> and the reason it was such a good deal was that it was within 90 days of the sailing day. And so we just said, let's do it. And we booked the trip. And um, so this is a small ship. We'll see pictures of it. And my husband's shirt that he's wearing has a picture of it on the back. Um, it was a sailing yacht, a four-masted sailing yacht, um, 150 passengers and 100 crew, so 250 people. And because of that, we were able to go to places that the big cruise ships cannot cover. And um, so that was one of the highlights of the trip, was going to some extremely remote islands in the, uh, one of the South Pacific archipelagos. And so um, you'll see some slides of that. Um, so these are some pictures from our trip. Some things we brought back, and uh, we'll have a little bit of music. I have a couple of girls coming over from DFA with their ukuleles, um, which is the, the instrument of French Polynesia, and um, only they would say ukulele uh, there. And, uh, so we'll have a little bit of music too. So let's get right to the slides. If you have any questions during any part of this, please feel free. And uh, make sure you hang on to your little pig slip, because we'll have the drawing for the, the uh, fresh flower lady, which in Tahiti is called a hei. It's the same word, it just starts with an H, and it means garland, and uh, so we have a real one, and um, we'll have a little drawing for that later on, okay? So, let's have a little vitamin C this morning. <laughs> so, the first thing is uh, a map, um, and uh, I've got an arrow pointing to Tahiti, and we went way out to the Tuamotu Islands, um, which are way off to the northwest on this map. Uh, have you got a, your little pointer there? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Now, well, let's see. Uh, there it is. Okay. That's, this is where we went. Fakarava, and then we went, so this was quite a long passage at sea, and then we went to uh, Rangiroa, and then we crossed way back over here to Ta'aha, and we went to Huahine, and we went to Bora Bora and Rayatea and finally Morea, and, um, which is right next to Tahiti and then back to Tahiti. So we did kind of an oval, kind of an oval trip. And these islands out here are extremely remote and have uh, very small populations. So, um, so here we go. All right, that was our first stop. <laughs> when we arrived in Papeete, the um, capital of Tahiti, we were uh, the first night overnight in a hotel. And this was the Intercontinental <laughs> Resort and Spa. That's their infinity pool. And that is the island of Moorea off in the distance. So that was our first view. And I'll tell you, swimming in that pool washes away jet lag really well. <laughs> and um, another view of the pool in the, in the lounge area. And they had some of those overwater bungalows that you see in the fancy resorts. So it was lovely. It was a lovely way to arrive. And that was our home for 11 nights. That is the wind spirit. And this is Fakarava. This was one of the first um, remote islands we went to. Population 850. And uh, although everybody's walking around with a cell phone, um, the, the culture is very much the way it has always been. The way of life is very slow. Uh, time is uh, looked at differently in these islands. It's um, very, very laid back. That chill island vibe is a real thing in these islands. And the people were extremely friendly and hospitable, just very welcoming. They met us at the pier with music, and um, it, was just, it was just lovely. It was just lovely, very quiet. So we walked across the island and did some beach combing, and you'll see a little bit of that. Um, so this is one of the not as good things, and I felt compelled to, to show this in the trip. 
uh, dogs in French Polynesia are uh, not well regarded. The, the, uh, there isn't the care for them that we would give culturally. They're just not considered really important. And so everywhere we went, we saw very many really um, sad looking strays in very poor condition. And um, so on the island of uh, Mrs. Makarava, um, there was just packs of dogs roaming. And we've been told about this and to be careful. Um, and as I watched, this woman pulled up in the van, opened the back door, and she had big bags of dog food. And uh, all the dogs came running when she barked and opened her, the door. So she was obviously helping to take care of these stray dogs. Uh, people have dogs as pets, but they're just not, they're not um, treated the same way that uh, other parts of the world treat their dogs. And so that may be upset as a dog lover. It's hard to see. Yeah. But part of the way life is, you know. Okay, so this was some, some of my uh, spoils from beach coping on Fakarava, which are on the table over there. So <laughs> if you want to have a look at the real thing there, I did bring them in. Uh, and this is uh, snorkeling with stingrays. Uh, and that fellow, the stingrays in the Pacific are about this big. They're, they're good size. Um, harmless, very curious, very curious. And you just have to watch out for the spine and the tail. And pretty much everywhere we snorkeled, there were stingrays. There were also sharks. So we snorkeled one day um, off a coral reef that was out in the ocean a bit. And uh, there were black tip reef sharks everywhere. And uh, then my husband and I were, were in the water, and he's all of a sudden in his snorkel trying to talk to me. And I'm like, and he's going like this. And I look down, and just under my feet, like if I'd done that, I could have touched it, was a nine foot lemon shark. So uh, it was thrilling. It was absolutely thrilling. <laughs> They're very placid, we were told, so we weren't in any danger. Um, we were told also to watch out for tiger sharks, and if we saw one of those, to swim like that in the back of the boat. So we never saw any of those, but the sharks, that was a thrilling, thrilling thing. So, ah uh, yes, the day of days. So one of our most wonderful days was on a private island. There are little, these little uninhabited islands, uninhabited islands are called Motus. And this was Motu Maheya, and we had the whole day there. Um, the ship basically unpacked itself onto the island. So there was food, there was a bar, there were chaise lounges, there was even restaurants on the island. And we spent the day there, and you could do whatever you want. You could snorkel, swim, hang out. I was pretty much in the water until I was completely pruned. <laughs> like, completely pruned. Water temperature, 81 degrees. Oh, yes. Everywhere. Everywhere we went, 81 degrees. So. And that's one of my favorite, favorite pictures. And I have a, uh, I have a little quote that goes with this one. There was prayer in the ocean which moves and rolls. The sea was the great mare of the world. Fire was the swimming mare. And this is from a Polynesian God's genealogy. So mare is a holy place, a secret place, and uh, fai are the singers. And um, just this bluebird sky everywhere. Sky. This is all still on the, the private island. And then another day, they were offering passengers a chance to have a photo op up in the bowsprit of the ship. So there's my husband. Water lilies on Rumpi Roa. And this is on Rangiroa. So when you when you arrive on these small remote islands, there would be uh, local uh, crafts people with uh, little booths set up. And very often you see women making the flower crowns or beautiful shell jewelry. And so I asked this lady if she would mind if I took a picture. She was working on that one. Um, and uh, she was very kind to let me do that. And that kind of a necklace, you would pay about $10 for it. So, and these simple ones like this, these were like $2. And all hand done. And um, so it was, uh, 
it was just beautiful to see how they used the shells. Now, John was asking me about language. French Polynesia is trilingual. Uh, the official language is French, but uh, everybody speaks Tahitian as well. And then most people also speak English. So uh, I found that my college French worked very well there. If I wasn't sure if people were English speaking. And that's our ship. Home away from home. <laughs> Uh, one of the um, lovely events we had aboard the ship was when we were in uh, Run the Girl Up, some of the local musicians um, and dancers came aboard and they taught us how to make the flower crowns and bracelets and necklaces and they danced and they sang and they showed us how to tie the pareo cloths, which I will show in a little bit. And um, so this lovely woman uh, gave me the wrist bracelet that she had made and uh, so there it is. And oh my gosh, the fragrance on that was just to die for. It was so beautiful. And then we arrived in Bora Bora. And I did stand on the beach and sing Valley High. I <laughs> to doing that. <laughs> this was Stephen, one of our snorkeling guides, and with his ukulele. And we did a uh, full day excursion around Bora Bora and snorkeling, stopping at an island, um, Polynesian lunch, the whole thing. And he sang and played his uke for us, essentially the whole day. And he had such a lovely voice uh, and wonderful personalities, just very friendly and funny. And uh, we really lucked out with him as our guide. And then he saved us. My husband and I, we were uh, in his snorkeling group, and we were out in the ocean, and um, the current was quite strong, and you're trying not to bump into the coral because it's sharp and you don't want to damage it, and we got, we got a little bit swept away from the group, and, uh, and we got trapped in this enclave of coral that we couldn't get out of. Them. So Stephen had to come rescue us, pull us back to the ship. So that was a little, I had a little, uh, fear in my stomach on that. That was a little, that was a little scary. And then uh, this was arriving on another private island for dinner and um, dancing. And the, this is the crew of the ship greeting us. And everywhere we went, we got the flower necklaces, the hades, everywhere. So it's just a lovely, lovely custom. This was our the dinner set up for that night. We had a pavilion with the grills and tables laid out, and just an amazing buffet and a bar. And you could walk around and explore the whole little island before dinner. And um, so we did that. Uh, it's a little out of focus, but I love this picture. And then uh, this is my Polynesian still life. Uh, my tide, a coconut, and my flower garland. <laughs> yes, Scott. What's the meal? What's the meal? Is it a lot of fish? Um, yes, of course, because it's your, it's ocean, you know. So yes, seafood, but um, the main meat is pork. It's pork. That is the main. Um, the and the beef that you get, which we didn't have much of, but comes from Australia. But pork is the meat of the Polynesian islands. So they do like a pig roast kind of thing. This was, again, on that little private island. And that's one of the famous mountains of Bora Bora. Uh, time for another quote. Nothing in European countries can provide an idea of what Polynesian landscapes look like as their splendor is created for imaginations other than ours. And that is by the French explorer Pierre Loti. And this is after dinner. So we had um, musicians and dancers come, and one of the things they did was the men did the fire pits. So they had these large uh, torches that they danced with and twirled and um, extremely acrobatic, really acrobatic, and very thrilling, very exciting, and drumming music in the background to accompany them. So that was, uh, that was really wonderful. 
And before they started the fire dance, one of the young men climbed up one of the coconut palms, uh, just so we could see how they do it. <laughs> Uh, this was our ship as we were returning from that lovely evening. They lit up the ship for us, and uh, the, uh, we were uh, taken back and forth, you know, in like inflatable boats and stuff. And so they stopped and let us uh, take some pictures of the ship. So beautiful. Okay, and this is Huahine. We did some amazing snorkeling. It's a little cluster of islands, and Kuahine uh, is the Tahitian word for women and sex. <laughs> and um, apparently one of the mountains, I think the one that's in the background, is the, uh, if you look at it sort of like you look at Mount Mansfield, it looks like a, a climbing crane. So that's where the name of the island came from. So. And yes, the water really is that blue, untouched. <laughs> So you see those dark masses in the water. That's the coral. That's the coral. And sometimes there's a good space between the coral and the surface of the water, and sometimes it's right there. And so you're swimming in between those big clumps of coral. And the tropical fish, it's like you're in the It's just unbelievable. The most phenomenal stuff I've ever done. All colors of the rainbow, fish and coral. Um, and uh, stingrays and charms too. Um, but just thousands and thousands of beautiful blue, orange, yellow, green, purple, striped, polka dot, everything you can think of for fish. Um, uh, so we, we did a lot, a lot of smart things with this pretty much every day. So uh, then later in the day, we stopped at another private island. This is still in Guapine, and we had lunch. And you can see the tables are in the water. So we sat at those tables in the water. The food was at that little bar. And um, you filled up your plate, and then you went and sat in the water. And the water was kind of up almost to our waists. Uh, very warm, like a bathtub. And the fish were swimming right around us as we ate. And uh, we put a little piece of bread down in the water, and we had 500 fish in there. <laughs> And so it got very quiet while we were sitting there uh, at our tables. And, and then everybody was having the same thought. I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> so that was one of the highlights of the trip, was eating lunch in the water with the fish. And then we walked across this little island. Coconuts everywhere, of course. Many varieties. Um, and this was the other side of the island. This is the ocean side of the reef, and that's me in the red, snorkeling. And those dark clumps of the coral. And this was the path we followed to get across the island through a, a coconut plantation. Uh, this is a private home on the island where we had lunch. People live very modestly in French Polynesia. Yeah, we did not see signs of great wealth as we traveled around. People's homes and lifestyles were very modest. Um, but everyone we spoke to, the locals we had contact with, seemed very content that that very um, chill island vibe thing going on. And I think it's because um, their wealth is the natural beauty that they have around. That's, that's the great wealth of French Polynesia. Sea urchin with my toe. Oh. We wanted water shoes. And this is Mo'orea. And it was by far the most beautiful island that we visited. <coughs> We did a land tour on Moorea. We found a lovely young woman to be our guide, and she took us inland. And one of the sites we visited was this 14th century Marais, which is a, a holy site. And this um, stone wall from the 1400s um, was a rectangle shaped enclosure where um, ceremonies were held, uh, warriors practiced their skills, 
And um, there's nothing left now at the site except the wall, but they, they have done some excavations and found some bits and pieces from back in the time. And um, so we saw a couple of these sacred spots uh, on the tour. Um, a black sand beach. Moria is volcanic. So this particular beach had the, the black sand from the volcanoes. And that cleared spot on the hillside is a pineapple plantation. Yeah. And a view from one of the overlooks, um, part of the drive we did. And that is our farewell sunset. Okay, questions? Any questions? Yes? Where did you pick up the ship? In Tahiti. In so, Tahiti. in Tahiti. So we flew to Los Angeles and stayed overnight, and then we flew from LA to Papiete. Tahiti okay. and stayed overnight at that glorious resort. And then the next day, we got on the ship. And so we departed from Papiete, and we did that big oval loop, and came back to Papiete. So, how many days was that? We were 11 nights on the ship, and then a night before, and then when we got back, our flight out was until midnight. So the ship had arranged for us to have hotel rooms at the same resort for the entire day. So we had a place where you could rest and take a shower and do what you want while waiting for your flight to go. So that was quite nice, too. What do most of the people do for a living? Uh, fishermen? Fish, yeah, well, tourism. Obviously, tourism is big. Agriculture is very big. There are lots and lots and lots of farms. Um, coconut plantations, pineapple, bananas, avocados, um, all these wonderful fresh fruits. Um, and uh, and then yeah, tourism, fishing, and uh, agriculture. And then in the big towns like Papiete, there are other businesses. Um, but the small islands where we were, people are pretty self-sufficient. It's amazing to see tiny, tiny little children on a weekend. The families will get together and just have a picnic by the ocean. You see the little tiny, tiny children swimming like fish. <laughs> Two-year-olds diving right in, swimming like fish. And the parents are not even looking. <laughs> it's like it's in their DNA, I think. <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Yes? Uh, any bug life there? Oh, yeah. oh, we didn't see any bugs, did we? Nope. No. And uh, electricity? Oh, yes. Uh, it's, yep, everywhere. Where, where did that come from? Um, it is, oh, well, solar a lot now, a lot of solar. Um, I'm not sure otherwise. I know a lot of it is solar. Um, we didn't see any wind towers, so I'm not really sure. Um, and on the ship, it was, we brought converters and everything, and we didn't need them. There got to be 120 on the ship, so it was very handy. <laughs> yes. I'm curious, would you go back in? Oh, yeah. Back in. Oh, my God. I never in my life thought I would see this part of the world. This was like a bucket list trip. Um, the, if I would go back in a second. The natural beauty is just not. And given a choice, would you stay a little bit longer? John, just to absorb it more? Yes. Um, I feel like, you know, some of the places we stopped, we were there for two or three days. So we weren't. Constantly, it wasn't like eight countries in eight hours. Kind of thing. Um, but yes, yeah, some of the people on the ship you could extend by another seven days. So some of them did a 17 day trip, which involved a little bit of a repeat of the loop. So um, yeah, we would, we would definitely, that opportunity came. Did you ever sail? Or was it always, uh, oh, yes, we sailed. Oh, yes, we did sail. Yep. How long to do that the stretch from the to the to the clock to the two mil twos? That was twenty four hours. That was twenty four hours at sea. And um, it was it was lovely. It was lovely. Hi, you guys are here. Let me check the time. Okay. We're gonna, I'm gonna do a couple other things and then we'll do we'll do that song. Okay. Uh, yes. Water was eighty two. What was the air temperature and approximate humidity? Very humid. 
very, very humid. Uh, air temperature was anywhere from 83 to about 88. It never cracked 90, but it was, uh, it was high 80s. It was high 80s, so, yes. Your photography is amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was wonderful to see all the sea creatures all that in the water. But what about birds? Um, we actually, one of the uh, places we visited the Tuamotus is a UNESCO heritage site, and we, we made a specific stop to see a type of bird that is, it's called a nadi, that is only found in that, on that island. So we didn't see a lot of bird life, but we did see some that were um, only found in that one place in the whole world. So that was... Really were they colorful? No, they were black. <laughs> they were black and white, but they were you know, unique to that part of the world, so it was very interesting. Yes? But so many remote islands, how did they handle education? Tiny little schools on the islands. Tiny little schools. It's like a one room school? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Yes? How do they ship out the pineapples? Oh, uh, by ship and air. If there's, if there's an airport. A lot of the little tiny islands do not have uh, airports. But even Vakarava. The first time we went to had a teeny little one lane airstrip. Oh. So, um, and two of the people on our trip got off at the first time. So, then left the cruise. Uh -huh. They were very sick. Oh, God. Uh -huh. Yes. What's the state of those breeds compared, uh, compared to some of the others in the world? Christine. Oh, they're not beached out, out. they're protected, um, and we did not see any place we snorkeled, we did not see any evidence of damage. Wow. So these are, I don't know who knows if that will last, but it's a wonderful change, but um, the places we snorkeled were pristine. Yes. How, how windy was it out in the boat? It depended. The, the picture you saw of my husband in the bowsprit, that was a very calm day. Um, we never had real rocket and rolling on the ship, I thought. We never had any storms. Um, a rain shower maybe, and then we passed. Um, it was breezy, but we took essentially all of our meals outside on the deck. So we had seating areas inside and out. And, um, so it was lovely. And the other thing that was amazing, you know, you're in the other part of the planet. So you're seeing a different night sky. You're seeing the southern night sky. And there's this phenomenal optical illusion at night. Of course, no light pollution when you're at sea. It's pitch black. And um, we would be reclined in chase lounges looking up at the night sky. And the ship would be gently rocking, and it looked like the sky was rocking. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely looked like the sky was doing this. So it was, it was amazing. It was wonderful. Okay, so I've got a couple of young ladies are here. We'll have them do their songs so I don't hold them up. And then um, I'll show you how to tie a choreo and um, talk a little bit about the pearls and black pearls. So this is Kara White and Sophie Thompson. And uh, they. Students. So when I knew I was going to do this, I said, would you guys come along and, and help me out on one of the songs? We've got to have you play me for doing French Polynesian music. So, so we're going to sing, um, we're going to sing a song called Correjo, which is a lullaby. And it's in Tahitian, and this is what it means. Shellfish, you live in the sea, you are the octopus's dinner. You are eaten by the octopus. You are brightness. Your shell. So perhaps, um, you know, perhaps an octopus got a hold of an auger shell, which I found while I was snorkeling in, you know, a uh, interior part. <laughs> so um, this is a very well known song all through French Polynesia. So let me just bring this up a little okay. bit. <laughs> a little short. Okay, all right, drop this down. Okay, for a roll. So, um, the swinging F chords would be.
become popular in this country uh, lately. It's had a little bit of a uh, rebirth in popularity, but uh, everybody in French Polynesia plays ukulele. Everybody plays ukulele and drums. Um, some of them more African style. They, they've uh, adopted in some other cultures. Um, but this is this is the instrument to have, and I'm still kicking myself I didn't buy it. There. So I have my mother's, which is in for repair right now, but I should have bought one from the islands. So, so would you guys like to help me with the, the uh, raffle for the flower next? Sure. Okay. Why don't we do the lady raffle? And we'll, um, um, so you put your put your mukes on the stage. Everywhere we went, every island we went to, we were greeted with flowers. I mean, when we arrived at the airport, kind of in Hawaii, we were greeted with flowers. Um, but we were also greeted with shell necklaces. And um, so it's not, it isn't something, you think it's just something that's done for tourists, but everywhere we went, the women were wearing flowers. And uh, so it's not just this kind of a touristy thing, it's really part of the culture. And um, so I couldn't get Tahitian flowers, unfortunately. So these are Vermont, Vermontish flowers. <laughs> but they are real. So Show okay, the way. why don't you guys reach in together and see if you can grab them? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna win. Where, oh. where, where, what are we what are they gonna win? What are they oh, should I pull it out? Yes. Coconut to make Manoi oil. And this is a bottle of real Manoi oil. Um, it's solidified because of our cold climate, but in, in the French Polynesia, it would be liquid. Like an olive oil carbon, you put it in the mm -hmm. fridge. So. Um, so, this is the magic balm of French Polynesia. This is why the French Polynesian people have such beautiful skin. <laughs> this is used as a sunblock, mosquito repellent, um, lotion, hair conditioner. Um, you can use it to heal uh, eczema or psoriasis. It's very good on that. Um, and uh, you can buy it everywhere. And I bought this in um, Rangiroa, one of the Rainbow Islands. And it is not scented. A lot of the Manoi oils you get in the touristy areas have about uh, jasmine or sandalwood in them because this is really rank smelling. <laughs> it does not have a pleasant fragrance, but it works really well. It works really well. And uh, so uh, I've been slowly making my way through the bottle because um, I wanted to pass. But the tiara flower is used to make this. So, this oh, it's like five bucks. Ah. It's not, it's not expensive. So, um, and you just use a little bit of acid. How do you get it to get soft? You can, I mean, I think in the summertime here, this is more liquid. Uh, in the winter, we keep our place out on the poolside, so it's it's solidified, but it spreads. 
accounts so you can still use it when it's solidified. So I scoop it out in the future and use it. Yes? Is French Polynesia still a part of France or is it independent now? Uh, um, kind of some of each. It does have a government, but it's, it's kind of like is Canada. It a it's kind of like right? Canada with the UK. You know, it's, it's still under French. Like the money is the Tahitian franc, which um, is part of the ties to France. It's not euros there. Yes. Because the interesting part of the world there is all the colonies that are French or were French get to uh, vote in the national election in France. And you have to, unlike the US territory, which I lived off for 19 years, we were never allowed to vote in the national elections. So in the old days, of course, the French election could not be called until all the votes were counted from all their territories. <coughs> it's a very, it's a, that's an interesting well, concept. It is. Um, and, you know, French is still the official language, so. I was in New Caledonia, that's why I was asking about French language. So we, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Piraeus. So these are also ubiquitous in French Polynesia. Um, these beautiful cloths that are worn by men and women, and they are not just for tourists. These are daily wear in French Polynesia. And so Dinny's going to model the ladies one for me. So come on up. There are hundreds of ways to tie these on. So I will show you one of the very common ways for women, and then we'll do one for the guys too. So pardon me if I go around you like this, Cindy. <laughs> so you twist like that. And there you go. Okay. Um, well, there, one of the young ladies who was one of our guides, that was her dress. She had a slightly bigger cloth. But you also can take, with a little bit bigger one, you can take this and tie it up around the neck, too. And, uh, so they're worn as beach cover-ups or just, you might have a t-shirt on underneath it, you know. Um, but that is very, very common. <coughs> Very common. You can also turn them in. I saw them turned into jackets. Beautiful. But it was very complicated how to draw the folds. So. Yes, this is from Rundi Roa. This is for uh, right tail. Excuse me, right tail. This is from one of the. It's it's like a glossy pattern. It's almost like a. Yeah. So um, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm going to do the men, so I need a guy volunteer. Okay, so this one I bought on Honey's uh, Row Up, and it was neat there, and I bought it because the fish that are on it look exactly like the fish we saw when we were So for the gentleman, Kind of do a pardon me while I put my hands around you. you kind of do a, uh, a fold over like that, and then once again you twist the ends to make the ties. And you kind of you kind of wear it a little off center like that. Yeah, there you go. And that's how you would see it on your ties. <laughs> And they wear um, uh, anklets and wristlets and headbands of uh, palm. Well, we all have James. There's a group. Are they made out of cotton? They are, yes. I'm not really sure. The, the silky one that Cindy had, that's rayon. Okay. This one feels more like a cotton. It feels like kind of like a shirt. So you're welcome. Thank you. So, and then we have the Francisco. They come in different sizes. You get small ones to have as a scarf. And the not as a Beautiful. So, this was done with negative. Um, the dyes were put into the cloth. Remember, Bianca, we went to do this. These were laid out on a table, and 
took the dice on, and then you put objects on it while the dice were back. And so that created the pattern. And you took them off, the <laughs> objects off. And uh, so you get a turtle with the flowers, um, almost like a native. So, and these were very inexpensive, very, and they were everywhere. Uh, we were warned to be careful and check the labels because a lot of the really uh, touristy ones come from Vietnam. Oh, okay. So I wanted to make sure that the ones we bought were from the island. So I always asked so these were from um, legitimately from French Polynesia. And then if you want to spend some money, the other thing that French Polynesia is known for for shopping are the black pearls. So these are saltwater pearls. They are farmed. Um, and they are called black pearls, but they come in every color. <coughs> blue, midnight blue, green, cream, yellow, pink, lavender, and black, of course. They come in many, many colors, many sizes, and they're graded according to their quality, their sheen, their luster, the size, the color. It's, all, it's kind of like grading a diamond. Yeah, there's all these requirements. And so I knew I was going to buy a pearl when we were there. So my husband found this one. This is a nice one for a gentleman, trace it. And then I have my little bobble, which I'll have on the table if you want to take a look at. This one is two colors. It's kind of a silvery color and a lavender color. And uh, you can spend $20 on a black pearl, and you can spend $60,000 on a black pearl. So we, uh, the store where we bought this had the full price range. They had inexpensive ones you could buy for souvenirs. And then if you had deep pockets, you know, they had fifty, sixty thousand dollar pieces of jewelry there. How do you suppose they know how to bring them for for monetary value? Um, well, it's an old first of all, it's been part of the culture of the islands for a very long time. And the people that farm these pearls, it's um, generational. These farms are owned by the same family for many, many, many generations. So they have a lot of experience in distinguishing high quality pearls from pearls that aren't as high quality. And uh, so I have my little paper. This this one is a, a gray A. This is gray A. This is top quality. I did not make fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you know they have there's a it's kind of like grading maple syrup. There are rules. Do you suppose it's like if there's an odd shape to if it? An odd shape or, or, or a, a pit or a ding, you know, any of that would affect the, the quality. Yes. Are we from the island? Are they still available? You know, I did not hear of any. Everything we heard was farmed. Um, probably originally, yes, they were. Um, there are places you can go in the islands where you can snorkel and get your own shell and have them open it and harvest your own pearl, which is um, what you then get to take with you, which is the different colors. The different colors? I have no idea. I would have to read up on that. Uh, I figured they were all going to be like this, which is the black color, but then I saw that they were like green so, color. But they're still all called black pearls. So. But you're welcome to come have a look at that if you want. Okay, and I think we'll do, I have one more little song for you, and I think we'll do the Tiara Legend. Okay, so the beautiful white flower, the Tiara, it's called the Tiara Abetaki, Abetaki. And this is the story of how it came to be in the, in the islands of French Polynesia. Once upon a time, Vahine Moya, a young girl of incomparable beauty, lived in the valley of Arahu in Rayateo, one of the islands we visited. She met a fisherman called Arigi Farite from Tahaha, which was another island we went to. They got married and had a girl who they called Tiaki Tiao. One day, Arigi Farite, the fisherman, heard some news. A missionary had arrived on the island and he was teaching the alphabet and how to write. Arimi Farite hastened to inform his wife that he was happy to learn that. They decided to go and live in the Mokoa, the district where the missionary lived, so that their daughter, who had become a beautiful young woman, could learn the alphabet and write. 
Tian Tao, the daughter of all of her lessons, and when she became a young woman, she met King Tanatoa and became his lover. Some time later, King Tanatoa left Raiatea to join King Komari of Tahiti for the Battle of Fei Pi. The king, accompanied by his warriors, left his island and lover. He asked Tia Itali to wait for him at home. However, the young woman told her lover that she felt like she was saying goodbye for the last time and she would never see him again. King Tamatoa tried to reassure her by saying that he was surrounded by the best warriors. Then Tia Itali took a coconut and told him she would go on Mount Temehani and watch out for his return and possibly see him leave to Tahiti. She told her, I will put this coconut in the hole of Ako Okihi Ura. The coconut will travel underground and will emerge close to the sea at the Piha Ura source. From there, the coconut will float from one island to another and will follow you. If you are thirsty, take the coconut, make a hole, and drink its water by bringing your mouth to it in the same way that you would do to pussy. <laughs> On her way, she stopped at the Torea Cave in which she fell asleep. The next morning, she went to the Tarei platform, looked at Tapu Tapu Atea and the sacred passage Te Avamoa and exclaimed, Oh, your paddle is shining in the sun, my love. It is shining in the foam of the waves. Then she continued to Ba'iomete, where she took a bath and quenched her thirst. She finally arrived at Apuhihi Ura, put her coconut in the hole, stood to the right, and looked once again in the direction of Tapu Tapuatea, and saw the outrigger canoe of her beloved. Oh, my love, your oar is shining in the sun in the foam of the waves. Your outrigger canoe is bobbing in the waves. Oh, my heart hurts. It hurts very badly, my love. I will plant my arm in the ground of the mountain. Then it will flower, and its flower will have the visual aspect of my open hand. It will be this hand, which is a flower now, which will give you a sign from my life. Leave and return quickly to me. Leave, O oh my love, and return quickly to me. Then she looked at the hole of Apuhidigura and let herself fall inside to die, as her sorrow was so huge and she could not bear to learn the death of her king, whom she adored so much. So the beautiful young woman is turned into the tiara flower. And uh, if you look at the, at the picture, you will see that it is, you know, has five fingers like a hand. So this flower is kind of sacred to the people of French Polynesia. A lovely legend about how it came to be. Okay, I have one more little song for you. And um, because my uh, ukulele is in for repairs right now, I'm going to use my uh, Mountain Dulcimer, which is American and not a French Polynesian instrument at all, but it will have a similar sound. So this is called uh, Ahoy. And Ahoy is a, whoops, a canoeing song, paddling song. And I could not find a translation of it. So all I can tell you is that it is about paddling an hour your canoe. And um, you can kind of feel that in the rhythm of the music. Actually, switch glasses. <laughs> These are the music glasses. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a pair that's exactly the right distance from the music stand, so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, this is off the way. Oh, <laughs> 
the Tahitian language is not hard to pronounce. It's similar to Hawaiian that you say every vowel uh, pronounce it. It wasn't originally from Polynesian in ancient times. Well, there's definitely a the Polynesian vibrating to Hawaiian. Yes, exactly. <coughs> Very, very good ask. Oh, yes, yes. Is that the ship in existence? Uh, no, no. I'm not sure what that is actually. <laughs> uh, another ship, perhaps. That was not our ship. We were on this side. <laughs> so, um, anyway, thank you so much for joining us.